I'm Francis Levy, co-director of the Philip Tatey Center. Dr. Edwin Sessian is the other co-director. And welcome to Emotion and Invention in Architecture. Before we begin this afternoon's panel, I wanted to make some announcements. This really is our last uh, round table, formal round table in our normal Philip Tatey series. Uh, we have another, one other event of this nature coming up in July, on July 10th. It's going to be, I hate to call them this, this way, but it's the Young Philip Tatey's group. It's, it's okay. <laughs> young Philip Tatey's, it sounds like Young Philip, you know, it's like, like <laughs> the, young, it's called Remind now. So, but it, these are pe people who are of the demographically younger persuasion <laughs> than me. Chronologically yeah. old. They're chronologically and demographically. They, live, they don't live in my neighborhood mostly. No. Uh, and they became interested in Philoctetes, so we encouraged them. And they're now doing their own event. And it's, it's sort of kind of related to a little bit. It, it didn't come out of this, but it, it's, it had to do with some of the themes in our psychogeography event, which, which was about the, the, the effect of place on consciousness. And, and this one is a little bit about the nature of place on the development of artistic identity. And, and the panelists will be five more youthful people who have a stat, who have, are making their way in New York City, artists, writers, I think a fashion designer. So it's a very, ex very actually a very exciting panel, and it's on July 10th. Now, a, a psychoanalyst to be. And, and a psychoanalyst, he's actually a practicing clinician, isn't he? Uh, he's a psychiatrist. He's a psychiatrist a resident, and a training. resident in psychiatry who's also a candidate in psychoanalysis. Yeah. Yeah. Our latest art exhibit that you see on the walls here relates to this afternoon's roundtable, and it's entitled The Architecture of Emotion, Interior and Exterior. Now, in the month of July, we're going to be having the Chamber Film Festival. It's going to be up here, not downstairs, where we usually have the films. And we are going to be showing two films by Jean-Luc Godard, La Chinoise, and Le Gay Savoir. And Richard Brody from The New Yorker will be kind of a, 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 the discussant, really. Yeah. on both of those films, and, we'll have a, and, and Matt will be involved with that also. And then we're showing a wonderful film by Chris Marker. It's a classic, La Jetée. So that, I believe, is the 16th, the 23rd, and the 30th of July. 9th, right. the 23rd, and the 30th. 9th, the 23rd, and the 30th. Please consult the Philip Tatey's uh, site. If you go to our site, www.philiptatis.org, we simulcast, and also you can see all past programs by simply going to the site and going to past programming and, and, and scrolling down and pushing the button. Oh, we actually, today, we have one person from Vermont watching, Adam Woodward from our staff, but people, there's one person in South Africa who watches and one in Romania, and uh, I don't know if anyone in China, but we actually can see who's watching. So um, it's, it's a global... We have a global presence. I'm now pleased to present Julio Salcedo. Julio Salcedo was born in Madrid and studied architecture at Rice University and Harvard's Graduate School of Design under Rafael Moneo and Enrique Morales, among others. Salcedo has taught architecture design and theory courses both at undergraduate and graduate levels at several universities, including Harvard School of Design, Syracuse University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Cornell University. He has contributed to various periodicals in the U.S. and Spain, including Passages, Praxis, and Architectura. Salcedo was awarded the Young Architects Forum Award from the Architectural League and the first prize of the international competition for the redevelopment of Hamar, Norway, in association with Mark Brosa. Salcedo's practice, Scalar Architecture, engages in interdisciplinary modes of architectural design and practice, particularly as they apply to landscape and urban design. Julio Salcedo will moderate this afternoon's panel and introduce our other distinguished guests. Thanks. Great, thanks. So uh, I think it would be best to introduce the other members of the panel and then we can sort of find our way around this sort of what seems to be a rather complex topic and um, make it a little more palpable for everybody. Um, David Hobbs to my left. Um, I first came in contact with David Hobbs through uh, the publication of a book that was the result of an exhibition that took place in Montreal. Uh, the uh, book is called Sense of the City. Uh, Sense of the City. Um, the book, uh, what, what the book does is it sort of rethinks um, and represents the uh, city in its more complex reality, uh, uh, the, 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 the qualities, the comforts, the communication systems and the sensory dimensions of public space in urban life. So it, what it does, it, 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 it's, a, it's sort of a, it's a new way to look at urbanism and to look at architecture through uh, the whole sort of, through all five senses. Um, and 
uh, it talks about the sensorial and the transactional experiences of urban life. Um, he's also the author of Empire of the Senses and of uh, Sensual Relations. And Sensual Relations, with a, they're both outside. He's a professor of anthropology at Concordia University the director of the Concordia Sensorial Research Team, and he teaches, uh, among other things, he's also teaching law, commerce, aesthetic practices, and census uh, across cultures. Um, yeah, and I think we'll, we can go into some of his other questions later. Um, Donald Albrecht, uh, sitting immediately to his right. <laughs> no. uh, left, sorry. Close. <laughs> I am just like at times. Uh, is an independent curator, and he's an adjunct curator of architecture and design at the Museum uh, of the City of New York. He's a fellow of the American Academy in uh, Rome. Uh, he's curated many exhibitions at Cooper Hewitt, the Getty, the National Building Museum, and many other places. Um, he's the author of The Design Dream, Modern Architecture in the Movies. Um, he's also the writer of a book that was not mentioned, but it's outside, which is The Mythic City, uh, which I just breezed through it and it looked like a wonderful book. He holds a Bachelor of Architecture from, from IIT, the uh, Mies campus, and I think that that, that figure of Mies, my figure, uh, might come up prominently through the discussion today. Um, uh, and uh, part of the... Um, the uh, both the I mean both the design dream book um, and another book that he's written on glass and glamour um, they, they discuss the promises of modern architecture uh, uh, not necessarily in a sensorial way or in an experiential way um, at the level of the individual but more as a sort of uh, Meta phenomenological way in terms of culture and what modern architecture means and what the materials mean. So um, I, I think it's, I, it, it's going to add a very significant dimension to, this, to, the, to the discussion, more in a cultural sense. Uh, immediately to my right is Sanju Masumbar, pronouncing it correctly. Um, he has a very en he has an endless and expansive biography and curriculum. Uh, he's a professor at UC Irvine in several uh, departments, including planning, policy, and design, Asian American studies, and religious studies. His last degree was a PhD from MIT in organizational studies and environmental design. Um, it's a long list of uh, articles he's written. The, their titles are really careful and precise, so I, I might read some of them. Um, even the Moon Has a Dark Side, a Critical Look at Vernacular Architecture, Creating the Sacred Altars in Hindu American Home, Architecture, an Artifact of Culture, question mark, How Programming Became Counterproductive, Analysis, um, Analysis of Approaches to Programming, uh, one we discussed during lunch today, Sir, please don't take my cubicle away. <laughs> <laughs> the, the phenomenon of environmental deprivation, de de um, his research examines social, cultural, religious, and organizational aspects of an environment. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy that he came all the way from California for this discussion also. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Jerome Weiner, um, Professor Emeritus of the University of Illinois, Chicago, of psychiatry. He's the, um, he's the editor of the, an the Annual of Psychoanalysis and he was an editor of psycho Psychoanalysis and Architecture, um, also the past president of the American College of Psychoanalysts. Um, the, um, on the cover of the book, uh, psycho Psychoanalysis and Architecture, um, it says something about nothing is more essential to architecture than our experience of it. Psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis is the study of that inner experience. Um, the book also uh, um, talks about Franklin Wright at, at a great lens, and this is the, the uh, chapters that uh, Jerome wrote and directed. And it talks about another figure, uh, which is Adrian Stokes. Adrian Stokes was a British art critic, and um, he, he, he introduced sort of Freudian thought to, um, uh, architect to art criticism. 
So he's a very prominent figure in sort of, um, and very different to Walheim, which is a contemporary in the in uh, sort of bringing the idea of experience into art and by derivation into architecture. So I think it's it's, it's a uh, it's a sort of fascinating topic. I mean, the, uh, one of the and maybe since we. Uh, since you were the last presenter, we can lead off with you. Um, one of the uh, questions that I had as, uh, as a sort of uh, intrus uh, in, of an intrusive nature to this is, uh, you know, what's the relation between phenomenology and psychoanalysis? You were uh, mentioned during lunch that there's a an idea of a, a, a more of a subconscious level of experience to it, whereas you know, the early phenomenological movement, Herschel and stuff, were very much about a cognitive experience of it. Uh, is there, what, what would, uh, as a mode to sort of approach this thing? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that uh, my work is limited compared to my fellow panelists in the area of, of, of architecture because I got interested in uh, rather late in life and uh, we had a conference on Frank Lloyd Wright. I got to know uh, Wright's granddaughter, who was the only person in the field of his uh, five grandchildren who went into it, uh, mm -hmm. the area, although his sons did. And we, uh, we did some, we had a conference, and we were fortunate mm -hmm. to get a Graham Foundation grant. Uh, and then we got another one to publish the book. Mm -hmm. And we then went international and in asking for uh, mm -hmm. uh, distinguished scholars to contribute. Mm -hmm. uh, my own work was uh, studying Wright. And uh, what I learned in interviewing architects and mm -hmm. speaking to them mm -hmm. is uh, not only are the, is the average observer of buildings and other architectural Mm -hmm. structures unaware of the unconscious mm -hmm. impact that may be resonating with their delight or dislike or hatred or fright mm -hmm. or of a particular structure, mm -hmm. uh, but frequently the architect has no idea either. Mm -hmm. And that I found fascinating, mm -hmm. that and many of the architects uh, don't want to know. <laughs> uh, and they handle that not by saying, I don't want to know what influences from my past or unconscious life uh, is involved in my work. Uh, they deny it. Uh, it's, it's, it's irrelevant, and uh, there's a myth still among many creative artists that if I really were to get into analysis or something of that sort, it would bring my career uh, to a close. I lose my capacity. Um, so one of my colleagues uh, did uh, one of our chapters is on interviewing four architects about designing their own homes mm -hmm. and what forces they thought were, uh, were involved in designing their own homes. And they uh, were limitedly aware of some things. So when you talk about phenomenology, again, you'd have to define it. And I really don't know too much about Husserl and other such things. But talking of it as the observable mm -hmm. Conscious, mm -hmm. what many uh, uh, psychological psychologists who are not psychodynamically oriented uh, think of as what's known is what's known, mm -hmm. uh, and what you can observe and study. Uh, well, we work in a different area, and we're very much interested in in uh, all kinds of creative people about what forces beyond their uh, their own knowledge mm -hmm. are operating mm -hmm. in the material of their work, not in why they are great architects. Mm -hmm. Freud said that uh, why people have these great creative talents, mm -hmm. uh, he threw up his arms. He doesn't know, mm -hmm. and I certainly don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, what makes for uh, a great architect? But we can talk about why a great architect has uh, the influence that he or she might uh, have on a given person, and we can talk about a lot of other senses. Mm. Uh, yeah. I can close at any moment. So. No, I, what I mean, I, we, we can. I can go on too. No, no. Maybe, maybe we can bounce the the uh, the, uh, the uh, question to the other side of the, of the panel. I mean, uh, Walter Benjamin very famously said that architecture is an art that is always seen in a state of destruction, right? I mean that. that the uh, common uh, passerby or the whoever is going to a building is not necessarily noticing the architecture that much. 
So, you know, how does the discipline deal with the fact that, you know, it's often seen in a state of destruction is very interesting. And to what, to what degree does the experience of the passerby, you know, whether it's conscious or unconscious, you know, uh, what's, the in, what's the productive friction between that experience and the piece of architecture? Uh, but if we look at it in a, in a larger urban picture, we can talk about urban design and not just the since, you know, not not just the visual sense of it all, but the you know, the sense of smell, the sense of the uh, haptic sense, you know, of tactile. And I think that it is fascinating that, that Benjamin describes you know, the experience of architecture as one of distraction, mm -hmm. in that um, so much of architectural theory and architectural mm -hmm. practice is informed by abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, the form of the building is what counts. The shape mm -hmm. and its relationship to the environment is often mm -hmm. overlooked. The fact that it is an environment mm -hmm. is often overlooked in that mm -hmm. process. And I don't go to the unconscious. I, I try and stay a little bit more on, on the level. But what we've been doing is exploring um, the sensory dimensions, both mm -hmm. of architecture and of urban uh, life in general. Mm -hmm. So we've been getting away from going on sightseeing tours and getting away from city maps and trying to understand both the contemporary sense-scape mm -hmm. of the city and also the history that produced that. Mm -hmm. And so we live in a, a world, for example, now where there was a systematic banishment of, of sound mm -hmm. and also odor. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, interestingly, just here in the United States, for example, in the 19th century, the noise of industry, the hum of industry, mm -hmm. was seen as a sign of progress. Mm -hmm. But the turn of the century, the 20th century, it gets redefined as the shriek of industry. Mm -hmm. And it must be um, suppressed, it must mm -hmm. be banished because anything that shrieks in that way can't be efficient. Yeah. And a new cult of efficiency <laughs> takes over from yeah. the hum previously. And so you have noise abatement campaigns yeah. that result in the silencing of the city. Yeah. Um, smell, in a similar way, through uh, while it actually animated all of the great um, public health movements of the 19th yeah. century, uh, because people understood there to be a connection between um, smell and disease, and to yeah. banish smell meant that you also yeah. eradicated the disease. Uh, that was sort of actually proved to be not the case mm -hmm. by, Koch, by the uh, discoveries of, of the germ theory of disease and so forth mm -hmm. subsequently. But it leads to a whole concern with banishing smell and therefore garbage collection mm -hmm. systems and mm -hmm. sewer systems and so mm -hmm. forth um, actually put all of the smell and the, and the pollution underground in, in mm -hmm. some kind of way, creating mm -hmm. an unconscious in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the question is then one of how the senses are allowed back Mm -hmm. uh, the after having been silenced in this mm -hmm. kind of way, the non-visual senses. Mm -hmm. And now you will find actually in the design of retail environments mm -hmm. meticulous attention paid to mm -hmm. multi-sensory advertising and multi-sensory marketing. So mm -hmm. um, they're allowed back, but in a very controlled kind of fashion, which has to do with, with moving merchandise. Right. So it's, it's really a question of, of opening our senses to the city mm -hmm. and exploring what it might mean to go on a sound walk or a smell tour, mm -hmm. um, or a taste tour, but mm -hmm. uh, culinary tourism is actually very much uh, mm -hmm. developed these days. Mm -hmm. And understanding you know, what that sensory ambience, that character, as mm -hmm. we say, of a place is. You can't apprehend it through a photograph. Mm -hmm. You've got to try and use your senses, develop your senses, mm -hmm. to, to find out just what the nature of the city might be. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, maybe we can also uh, ask, the, sort of bounce the question back to this side of the table. It's becoming an interesting, like a tense match. But uh, it, I, I am also uh, intrigued to find out um, you know, how religion and different cultures sort of uh, read the city differently uh, or read the domestic space differently. Uh, you know, or how... Not, it's not just a question of how conscious of, a, of an activity that is, but um, how much does that shape uh, an environment? Uh, and I know that you've done all this work in terms of domestic environments with uh, both Hindu and Muslim populations in the U.S. So is there, um, if, if it's expanding your work a little bit, and maybe talk about that to some degree. There are two points uh, here. One is the domestic scale and one is the urban scale. Mm -hmm. uh, at the domestic scale, some of what you were talking about, uh, creating an environment that is 
multi-sensorial mm -hmm. and provides that kind of experience. Particularly when you look at religion, especially mm -hmm. in the Hindu home, you mm -hmm. find that there is a tremendous amount of inclusion mm -hmm. of the various kinds of sensorial exp experiences that we mm -hmm. think about. So for example, um, they have an altar, mm -hmm. and on the altar, they have some activities they perform in the altar, so it's cleaning, it's mm -hmm. putting up things mm -hmm. in the altar, so there's that haptic touch mm -hmm. experience of it. Mm -hmm. There are the visual images of the gods, the sculptures of the gods, as well as mm -hmm. portraits and actual mm -hmm. you know, sort of artwork, plus mm -hmm. photographs and easily commercially purchased mm -hmm. art that's mm -hmm. framed, sometimes not mm -hmm. even framed, that's put up not only at the altar, but in various different spaces in the mm -hmm. home other than those spaces that are considered to be profane. Mm -hmm. So there's a hierarchy of spaces mm -hmm. in there. You also find that the performance arts are engaged uh, significantly because there's chanting, there's, uh, and if, if they themselves can sing, mm -hmm. they perform that. They have family and friends mm -hmm. invited who perform this. Mm -hmm. But if that is not possible, they put on records or CDs, uh, and so these are commercially available. So there's the, the oral ambiance that's created. Mm -hmm. um, they light incense, mm -hmm. the light of fire, and that provides the um, smell kind of experience, and so on. So that there is a more complete kind of an environment created inside the home. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself is something that you experience. So you walk into the home, right at the entrance, mm -hmm. there are elephants mm -hmm. greeting you because mm -hmm. that's a sign of auspiciousness. Mm -hmm. Not only that, in front of the entrance, usually they uh, create little diagrams which are called rangoli or alpona. And those are mostly created by women. And it's usually done in India every day. And it's mm -hmm. made out of rice powder which the ants and other insects consume. So next day you just wash it clean and mm -hmm. um, create another one. Mm -hmm. There's symbolics associated with this. Mm -hmm. The nature of the diagram gives signals to people as to if somebody has an infectious disease. So you look at the diagram and you know you mm -hmm. choose to enter or not to enter. Mm -hmm. And so go going right through the house, the altar then mm -hmm. is um, best located in a separate space but when they do not have that possibility in the immigrant home, mm -hmm. sometimes it's located um, in cupboards or in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, if, if there's the, the thought of polluting it mm -hmm. is what's problematic for them. And that comes from people unknowingly making contact with it or walking in with their shoes on. And so they have to create this little environment that's separate. It also performs as a meditative space, mm -hmm. which means there's a sort of calming effect. You want a space where you can transport yourself. You want to be able to meditate. So this is all within the home. And then outside the home, you look at cities. Um, mostly we've been talking at lunch about cities in the West. We've mm -hmm. been talking about Copenhagen, mm -hmm. Madrid, etc. Mm -hmm. Look at cities in the East. There are some Japanese colleagues who have been doing studies um, for example, they find that the cities come alive, start coming alive, they've sort of timed it, the activities, at 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. So it's still dark. And then people pick up the activities. Mm -hmm. And then there is a break when these hawkers and movable carts that are set up, mm -hmm. when in between, say, 10 o'clock and lunchtime, mm -hmm. there's a lull in the activities. And then it picks up again during lunch hour. Mm -hmm. And then again comes down during the afternoon hour and picks up again in the evening and goes all the way till 11 p.m. or something mm -hmm. like that. There you get the smell of the food that's being prepared right on the street. Mm -hmm. you, you get the clangs of the person preparing the food, the, mm -hmm. the sound that comes with it. Mm -hmm. You're able to buy it and taste and get that experience of it. You're getting all the sounds of the people who are negotiating in order to acquire this. Mm -hmm. And so there is this tremendous oral ambiance that we tend to overlook. And some of the Western-influenced designs mm -hmm. tend to do away with some of that because that's seen as problematic, the sounds of horns, <coughs> noises, etc. 
So one could go on, but there's a tremendous amount of, sort of sensorial kind of feel to the city, the street life, etc. cetera. Um, there's a professor in Wisconsin who just finished her PhD on Chinatown in New York. Mm -hmm. and she talks about how the smellscape spreads out from the individual stores, and she kind of plots in a diagram mm -hmm. how far you can get the smell of a particular store, mm -hmm. or the sounds that go with it, and mm -hmm. so on. So there's, a, there's an effort there to try to recapture once again the city in all its dimensions. Mm -hmm. But um, beyond this sentient experience, as I've been thinking about it, there is an extra sentient experience that perhaps you were referring to mm -hmm as being the unconscious, perhaps there is something beyond the senses that we are able to, I wouldn't like to use the word observation because it gets linked to the sight, but there are ways in which we absorbed, absorb the effects of the city that we tend not to be able to sort of even talk about, but I think in literature perhaps it comes out in some essays, etc. So maybe that you can talk a little bit about. Mm -hmm. To, uh, to comment briefly about that, uh, my office is on Michigan Avenue, a very busy uh, street across from the Art Institute. There's a lot of street noise. There was so much, in fact, that I had extra windows put in, so it's one of the quietest places I know of. And the relief of walking in at times to somebody who's under some stress is enormous, but they don't say uh, always, it's so quiet here, that's great. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for an opportunity also to talk about unconscious haptic touch. Mm -hmm. uh, in my career, I've had five different couches, and uh, at one point I had a corduroy one. And uh, I had a patient who came in, uh, no one, by the way, no one ever mentioned that I changed mm -hmm. on any right. of these occasions, right. consciously, which baffled me. And one woman came in and said, uh, I had this dream last night. This was between the first and second. Uh, I was having a great time lying on the beach, mm -hmm. except the sand was so rough <laughs> that I kept touching it. This was the quarter I couch. Right. And it was irritating. <laughs> and I thought, gee, the, be the uh, beach used to be so smooth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's happened here? <laughs> So uh, when we talk about this various kinds of, uh, you know, we know in literature there, there are all kinds of uh, Proust and mm -hmm. uh, unconscious, of what was unconscious mm -hmm. with the Madeline comes right. forward. And uh, uh, there's a wonderful uh, unconscious perception uh, in a Freud case uh, of smell. Uh, and that Freud was, was an inveterate cigar smoker, as many of you may know. And he smoked cigars during the sessions. And uh, one of his patients, the Dora case, uh, has a dream about something's burning. And Freud had yet to discover that his impact on patients uh, was uh, uh, profound and that uh, she was irritated with him in various ways and has this dream that there's something burning. And he only much after she quit realized that may have had something to do with his cigar. Uh, so. When I talk about unconscious, and when you're in a space, I'm using the analyst's office perhaps, or the relationship, or whether it's a park. Another um, uh, favorite anecdote, there are a lot of parts of Chicago are not safe at night. And a, a, a friend told the story once of being in Europe, in a city where it's quite safe to be in the park at, as it got dark. And that uh, a child uh, became more and more uneasy not quite sure why, and saying, we want, I want to go home. I want to go back to the hotel. I want to go home. So there's this kinds of perception of spaces of, of, of various kinds of things and sensual that are not fully uh, in our awareness and often color positively and negatively our experience. And uh, I have another example, but I'll wait. I mean, just to say one point I, about yeah. uh, the beautiful ethnography that Sandra has, has shared with us. Um, I would refer to that phenomenon as the senses in diaspora, in that you have Hindu populations transplanted to North America, recreating the sensorium of their homeland with mm -hmm. the materials at hand. And in that way, not just passively experiencing the senses, but actively creating these sensory environments that give a sense of home, but in a completely different context. And What's remarkable is how that 
can go on within the context of the very sterile, cubicle kind of you know, North American houses um, that, are, that, that this would occur in. And it shows that remarkable transposability of the senses and the way in which, in this case, domestic space, but also public space, is appropriated and transformed. So that in spite of what architects have done to our senses by denying them with glass towers and steel structures and so forth, uh, you find these um, sort of attempts to recreate uh, a sensorium and very effectively. Maybe but I think all the time, I, I think people do notice architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, they oftentimes notice the good because of the destruction of mm -hmm. the good. Mm -hmm. In another example, a mini great example of Penn Station, mm -hmm. and now people seeing how great Grand Central is. Mm -hmm. And there's an understanding mm -hmm. because Grand Central is such a great space to experience, people say, oh my God, you know, Penn Station was torn down. Why did we ever let that happen? Mm -hmm. You know, at the height of sort of a modern movement, why do we ever let that happen? So, in a sense, people are, I think, I think they are aware. New Yorkers are very aware. I mean, we're all experiencing this tremendous building boom. Mm -hmm. And when we're not being hit on the head by cranes, which is the most <laughs> haptic of all experiences, <laughs> and I think we're really very aware and very concerned, in a sense, about the loss of light. And, you know, so I think there is in reverse a kind of awareness, a sensitivity to the built environment. Yeah, I mean, if we also bring experience from an individual level to a collective level, I mean, the, the, the work from your book on film and architecture in film, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it would be interesting to talk about how, how architecture is sort of you know, has this uh, linguistic persona to it and can sort of signify certain principles or mm -hmm. ideas. Uh, so I would, I would be curious. Well, there are two. I mean, I would say there's probably two cities that are the most mediated, certainly through mm -hmm. movies. Paris and New York <coughs> are the big two, I would think. I mean, Rome, I'm sure, is there with La Dolce Vita, but it's, New York is the most mediated city, and there's almost, there are two cities here. There's the real city, and then there's this fictional New York. There was a man some years ago who wrote a book called The Celluloid Skyline, mm -hmm. and that's his thesis, that it's not, the thesis of the book is that actually it isn't as if there is the New York we live in, and then there's the reflection of it in the movies. Mm -hmm. There actually are these two New Yorks mm -hmm. that you can read them, and they follow their own mm -hmm. kind of logic. Ours follows a logic oftentimes of finance and money and zoning, mm -hmm. and the movie New York follows logic of, of narration and narrative. Mm -hmm. And there are certain directors who are brilliant at manipulating that and I maybe I'm alone in this because I watch a lot of old movies but I go down the streets of New York and sort of am living both of those mm -hmm. realities mm -hmm. and I think sometimes the feeling of being endangered or whatever comes from those powerful images of film film teaches us those feelings mm -hmm. because they bring camera work they bring music they bring sound they bring shadow they bring light they bring this synthesis that the real world, they heighten it in a way. And so they make us, they become a lens through which we mm -hmm. see the real New York. I mean, I, just when we were discussing earlier also, I mean, this, this idea of the collective, I think, for, for an architect is sort of interesting because you're, in a way, so sometimes there's a public, sometimes there's a client, uh, but often it's a little more diluted who, who, who the audience is going to be for the piece of work, how conscious mm -hmm. you're going to be of them, how not conscious you're going to be of them. But um, I, I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by sort of two stark images that were posed here. Uh, one of them is this incredibly um, intertwined reality of urban spaces in the East, which is sort of like, there is. It's very hard to untangle the uh, individual from this collective experience, and then the other one is the is the patient going to the sort of isolated room with the double layer of glass. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and corporate culture in, in the West and in, in America kind of has pulled that, advanced that further and further. Mm -hmm. That kind of cleanliness, the sort of antiseptic quality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very clear, but if you go, I mean, the most amazing, one of the most amazing cities is, is Naples, mm -hmm. Italy, not Florida. Not right. Florida. Right. I mean, it's quite astounding right. how these yeah. people live in right. this city right. with these narrow buildings and these Baroque 
facade that are falling down on you and also just the openness of the, the food stalls and the restaurants, everything is just there. And to an American coming from New York, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But they seem to find it perfectly fine. To us, it's like, oh my God, it was so intense an experience. And there's a feeling of danger. For some reason, the the overflowing quality of the food stalls, the sound, and of course the famous thing with the motorcycles where they drive by you know, at 90 miles an hour, it really feels dangerous. And yet, when you're there with somebody who knows the city, they say you're not in any danger. Mm -hmm. But there's something about the sensory overload coming from a more western city that's more corporate like New York or London. Mm -hmm. It's shocking. You know, to experience it. But it makes you see New York differently when you come back to it. But you should think, God, I don't think I could live in it. But wow, that's a sensory experience. Right. And in Manhattan, of course, we're losing that more and more. This is the Chinatown story. I remember even 10 years ago, you could walk through Chinatown and there was foods that had very strong odors and you didn't quite know what they were. Or when the meatpacking district was being transformed, those early days when it was being gentrified, you'd go to some chic restaurant or nightclub and you'd still have that strong smell of blood at night. Mm -hmm. And you'd have a slight stickiness, mm -hmm. which you kind of knew what it was but didn't want to think what it was. Mm -hmm. That's gone now. You go to the meatpacking district now, that is, mm -hmm. that quality of it once having been what it was is completely gone. So we're really losing that. Whether we're losing it all over New York City, I don't know. I have a feeling not. But we're certainly losing it in Manhattan more and more. Yeah. The. Um, Thank you. I mean, the other part of 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 the discussion today, which I thought was interesting. I mean, I, I think that. In a way, I had sort of framed the discussion in terms of contemporary practices mm. and what I was seeing out in terms of cutting edge practitioners and the type of buildings that were written about and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I, I do see a camp that is um, very intrigued by the sensorial, but mm -hmm. I'll bite that, that a sensorial practice is just visual as I see it. And it's sort of detached actually from the. Uh, from the transactional um, exchange between the individual and the environment. It's just sort of very visual, very detached, very computer-oriented, you know. Uh, so it's so I am quite critical on, of some of those practices. But some don't, uh, say. Well, some don't. I'm saying, I mean, like Herzog and the Muir and some right. other people are very sensorial. But And then the other sort of polarity within this range that I've been seeing is it, it's a practice that is very much sort of interested in um, in just relational practices where the architecture is just is merely uh, scaffolding mm -hmm. for activities to take place. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that if you're very smart about the placement of those activities or uh, if you're very smart about the placement of those, of those activities vis-a-vis -vis the city, vis-a-vis -vis each other, that the adjacency of these activities creates sparks mm -hmm. and create an architecture that is of interest because there's, some, there's a juxtaposition between people and program, and that becomes pretty fascinating. It sounds to me like it, it, we started talking about the sensorial, and very quickly we sort of gravitated towards this idea of adjacencies and um, um, and activities sort of being close to each other. Uh, but you wouldn't think of this new architecture as being sensorial whatsoever. So I mean, it's it's an interesting full circle uh, that that the discussion has taken place. Um, um, I'd, I'd, I'd be curious to to know maybe a little more if if you take the hard the hardcore approach to this new discipline in architecture, which is you know a scaffolding for activities, uh, matrices of locations of programs. Um, you had done some work with um, organizational practices and so on. Um, what do you see um, uh, experientially derive about some of these practices? And what do you see as sort of merely functional? Um, you know, um. For a while, I, I guess with modernism, we had moved towards um, almost an image of single function oriented spaces and buildings. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we label spaces such as kitchen, and mm -hmm. we kind of assume that only cooking 
kinds of activities occur there. Mm -hmm. There's a separate dining space where mm -hmm. dining occurs. There's a bedroom, there's a living room, and a family room. Of course, the living room family relationship is very interesting there, too. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this, um, I, I guess with modernism, there was this mm -hmm. interest in developing spaces that would serve those particular functions that we had envisioned mm -hmm. very well. But then people are starting to realize that these spaces and our lives are much more complex than that that mm -hmm. multiple functions are performed, mm -hmm. that even though a space might be a kitchen, mm -hmm. that is the place, it turns out, for many women, that's their office. That's where mm -hmm. the place they pay their bills, etc. Mm -hmm. That's the place where children get socialized. Mm -hmm. That's the place you learn about how your parents cooked mm -hmm. and what kinds of aromas Mm -hmm. emanated from that food. Mm -hmm. So these multiple uh, and more complex images perhaps can lead to, mm -hmm. to designs mm -hmm. that would have a, a multivocal, multifunctional, mm -hmm. multisensorial, mm -hmm. and also extrasensorial kinds of experiences mm -hmm. that we might, we might start engaging architecture in a much more holistic way mm -hmm. than we perhaps did in the past. Mm -hmm. I think the end point of that functionalism um, is you know, family homes where there's a living room that nobody ever goes into mm -hmm. and a dining room that nobody ever eats in. You use the dining room only for doing your taxes once a year, otherwise it remains <laughs> pristine and, 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 and self-contained. And so therefore, you know, it's actually become a necessity to rethink interior space on the part of many North American families as well, in that there were all these, that, that functionalism you know, mm -hmm. derived in that way. And, and similarly, you know, the, the separation of the senses. You you have a concert hall to entertain the ear, you have uh, you know, a picture gallery to entertain the eye, um, and you have what is there for, for the nose? Well, um, what is there properly you know, for the touch? Is it a gymnasium or, or, or not? Uh, but again, you know, mixing these things up is what a lot of performance art is about nowadays, and indeed some of the ways in which performance art and architecture combine reveals a discovery of a multisensoriality which goes along with multidisciplinarity which goes along with this multifunctionality. So it was almost as if you know, breaking the separation of the senses uh, and enabling these sort of crossovers to occur has become part of the great unraveling of modernity uh, that we are now involved in, which is not postmodern, but it's just um, finding other ways of, of well, dedicating. The, 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 the big example of this was, and I don't, I don't think it ever worked as planned, I may mm. be wrong, in 2001, when, Rem, when the Dutch architect Rem Koolhaas did the Prada store, on Broadway and whatever that is, Prince. Spring, right? Prince. On Prince. There, the idea was of bringing these functions together. This was not going to be just a store, and mm -hmm. so there was, there was, there still is mm -hmm. a kind of amphitheater mm -hmm. in the middle of the store, and there were going to be concerts, and there were going to be events, and there were going to be lectures. And whether it ever worked or not, I, mm -hmm. I would imagine probably not, because the Prada thing is so off-putting. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in the store, you you don't want unless you're going to the clothes, you don't want to come back. And you're constantly being watched, you know, by these salespeople, you know, because obviously what ended up happening was it became a kind of an art museum. Mm -hmm. So you're feeling like you're in the Museum of Modern Art more than you're in some kind of arena you want to come back to. There's nothing friendly about it. I don't think it ever, the sort of the agora, the modern agora, it never mm -hmm. happened. But Rem Koolhaas does try mm -hmm. in all of his projects to create this issue of these adjacencies that will hopefully spark an urbanism mm -hmm. because that's what makes great urbanism mm -hmm. that's what I mean, that's what makes Rome Rome Paris that's what makes it great is this juxta this collision mm -hmm. of various functions mm -hmm. that great urban designers have figured out mm -hmm. how to do mm -hmm. I mean the great Baroque designers of the Piazza Navona knew how to do it mm -hmm. you know so but it became also the idea this is our space mm -hmm. Uh, where uh, I have not been in the Prada store, uh, but I have the sense one would still feel it's Prada store. It is a not, private space, yes, right? Not our space, where the fountain is our. Yes, America out. especially continues to privatize, so that yeah. many people. This is much much discussed. We think these are public spaces. Mm -hmm. They seem to be, but they're actually private spaces. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of surveillance. And there are clues and cues being given to you that this is really not a public space. And the Prada is a great example. It's very off-putting. 
at the risk of sounding like a company man, I'm going to go back to the psychoanalytic uh, office and uh, the sense that uh, one of our contributors in, in, in our book uh, was an architect who had also had experience as being an analytic patient. Mm -hmm. And whose space is this analytic room? Well, I pay the rent. So it's my space, but increasingly, mm -hmm. as a patient, the NALSAN becomes more and more involved in it, it becomes a mutual space. Mm -hmm. And that there are parts that different people notice in the office, mm -hmm. and other parts, uh, the pictures that are hung, some people have no idea what they're, and others right. are associating a way that uh, that's this or that, or that's my picture, I see that it's back where it belongs, and in my office. Uh, so I, I think the the whole notion of whose space is it mm -hmm. can be extended uh, a lot further, and uh, people, as they get more and more comfortable in the, the, the psychoanalytic process, feel uh, it's a comfortable space for me to be in, uh, as even though it's not my space. How do you how do you deal? I mean, it's it's always a great interest to me. Is the you know. Is there a need for a certain new neutrality of the environment for your practice to be more successful, or if it were highly con if it were highly configured, would it be better? I mean, what, what's the? Um, I mean, would you get different reads from different patients if? Uh, I mean, I guess I'm sure there's an ongoing discussion about whether you're lying down or you're sitting. I guess yeah. nobody lies down anymore. Or, uh, but untrue. 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 No, not true. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. But yeah. so it, because. As a designer, uh, you know, the more you try to push uh, a phenomenal agenda, the more you define things to a degree where they're don't they're not multivalent anymore. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's that's it's a, a wonderful, wonderful question because it brings back a. a, a a funny memory to me. Uh, at one point, the university, uh, I moved universities, and part of the deal was I had a designer provided to design my office. So I showed her some things, et cetera, and she said, kept saying, you can't have the couch back of the chair back of the couch. It looks awkward, and she kept moving it back. I said, "This is the you know the, that's where the analyst sits." Well, he shouldn't sit there because it's throwing the room off. Uh, so that's one thing. But as far as the neutrality, you bring up again. In the old days, it was thought that you should be a blank screen as much as possible, and not have anything in your office that would be cueing people this way or the other. Uh, until people realized, of course, whatever you're, if you had a totally blank office, as I did for a moment, uh, for a few weeks while I was moving, and one patient said, hmm, you're a minimalist. <laughs> I said, no, the furniture hasn't completed coming yet. So uh, there are things where people will get some idea, but it, we usually don't have highly personal tastes in, uh, or pictures of your family, and some people do, some don't, but most don't, give individual cues about, we want to know what's inside of the patient, and how can we facilitate in a neutral environment that material coming forth. Well, that's in our, by the way, I should point out in our current show on the, in the uh, annex here, that was how we mm -hmm. keep coming in our, these are all photographs by Saul Robin uh, that are of uh, therapists and analyst offices. So you can examine some of these strategies. That yeah, get a, a comparative study. Yeah, exactly. But I, I, I mean, and maybe it's a question for David too. I mean, do you? I mean, we we sort of touched a little bit of you know the individual versus the collective psychoanalysis and modernity, the rise of the individual. You know what that's that for the senses. Um, what's your take on this question of neutrality vis-a-vis -vis the senses they are sort of how strong they may be and what does that do for a society or yeah. I think it's a, a, fun, a foundational question and let me just describe one yeah, yeah. Uh, study that we've done in the Concordia Sensoria research team <coughs> in our multi-sensory marketing project we compared Walmart with a store known as Ogilvy's, which is a, a classic department store in Montreal, five stories. It's actually now consists entirely of boutiques. Mm -hmm. And we tried to compare the sensory ambience of the two. Mm -hmm. We found that Walmart.
art represented sort of degree zero of sensation mm -hmm. um, in the sense that it was a big box store, of mm -hmm. course, and uses the color gray, mm -hmm. as, which doesn't seem appealing at all as, yeah. as its signature color. Mm -hmm. um, the most conspicuous sound was the beep of all of the registers um, mm -hmm. taking the prices. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a tremendous hustle and bustle. And mm -hmm. Friday night, Walmart rocks uh, because of the way in which all the people congregate there. Mm -hmm. So there was very little you know, tactile stimulation in the mm -hmm. sense that really you were attached to your shopping cart and your shopping cart guided you through the aisles um, and there was a kind of mechanization of movement as a result. Ogilvy's, where a number of my student research assistants got thrown out of because they just felt so uncomfortable, um, it was so high-end um, and just couldn't blend in whatsoever, um, was instead had you know, chandeliers from the ceilings and Greek pillars and marble and the color was a forest green and plaid to connote the Scottish connection. And you know, there were a whole series of things just about the experience of going up the escalator as almost giving you a sense of upward mobility. Um, whereas you know, Walmart was all on a level and very democratic in that regard. Um, and, and then you know, things like um, gloves uh, that felt like butter in one person's description. They just were so excellent in their, in their design. And so there was this, you know, for the high-end store and all these different boutiques, internationally famous, there was this plethora of sensations, all very pleasing, all very seductive. And indeed, the perfume counter right at the opening was one that, that enveloped you in, in a very sweet kind of aroma. Um, but Walmart takes that no-frills approach and mm -hmm. achieves total sensory neutrality, almost deprivation, mm -hmm. precisely because of its ideas of no-frills, okay, not a cent spent on ornamentation. Mm -hmm. So total functionality, mm -hmm. uh, where prices are everywhere. At Ogilvy's, you had to look at tags and, and even couldn't find the price, being because it was, what does it matter what it costs? Um, it's how it feels that, that matters. And so, you know, I find that Walmart as a public space, because it was a public space, there was a, a tremendous mixing of cultures and of people on that Friday night, you know, and, and other times as well at Walmart, but it was achieving that degree zero to enable everybody to find a common place. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, again, Ogilvy's excluded people uh, and only invited in certain ones because of its way of appealing to the senses with a certain element of, of, of refinement. This is a very interesting point, which actually I think Walter ben Benjamin has pieces on, work. Uh, on the on the box story. And then Adam Gupnik in the New Yorker about five years ago had a wonderful piece, uh, I think it was a series of pieces, looking mm -hmm. about the department store, and its significance in the rise of the bourgeoisie also, and I don't mean in bourgeois society, but in the sense of a kind of post- Kind of uh, aristocratic society in which all the kind of manifestations, of, you know, of the, it's like the opera house with its varying seating. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the departments are offering these kinds of identities. Mm -hmm. And Choices display of, becomes, even in, in, in the first department shows in Paris, mm -hmm. displays become very important. And also there's a, a lot of, there's a couple of things. One is the surfeit of goods. They would do displays, which they do yeah. now. If you go to the Ralph Lauren stores, you see this. The, he does this effect. Well, there'll be eight million ties, and it gives you this sudden, somewhat fearful feeling of like I've got to have them all, you know. <laughs> and early department stores did that. Also, the plate glass. Much Benjamin wrote lots about the plate glass because you're up, you're able to see the objects, but you're not able to touch them. So there's an, a sense of like you know delayed reaction. You've got to go in. And there are marvelous, Zola wrote a fabulous book called Ladies Paradise, hmm. all about the urban and the urban effects and the psychological effects on people in department stores. In Zola? The, yeah, Zola. Zola. Emil Zola. Zola. Mm -hmm. Oh, Zola. Zola, yeah. Zola. What's it called, Ladies? In English, it's called Ladies Paradise. And it's an amazing book written at the time of, like, the making of the great Parisian department stores that are all about this. And, and it lives on today 100%. Mm -hmm. If you go into Bergdorf Goodman, you go yeah. to Sachs, they follow the same psychological... And you're right, the perfume counter is always in the front, which gives you that immediate enveloping. Mm -hmm. Whereas Walmart has testers right. that they don't diffuse. I, I once right. smelled, <laughs> at, at, at Christmas time, I, I, saw, I smelled some kind of cinnamon, but I'm, I'm sure it was a, an hallucination. I mean, it was, uh, you know, but there, there was purposely no stimulation there, uh, and the gray, I think, signified that. But one of the things also about Ogilvy's is that everything was positioned and almost spotlighted. And so, you know, whereas quantity and abundance was a, a theme right. of Walmart, yeah. there was this separation 
separation of goods oh, oh, okay. in, in, in Ogilvy. And, and then I think also you know, the concern, because there was, in Benjamin um, describing the flaneur strolling mm-hmm. yeah, and taking yeah. in the spectacle of oh, urban yeah, life, okay. uh, but now the immersive nature of, of retail environments is what's quite remarkable in that you know, carefully chosen scents are being um, sort of injected into the atmosphere, very carefully selected colors in terms of stimulating or relaxing you. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, there's one store in Montreal, Pure One Imports, which has as its uh, invitation, get in touch with your senses. Mm-hmm. And it lists them all and how you can find gratification for each of your senses by shopping there. So whereas the, the flaneur is mm-hmm. a visual appropriation, now it's the creation of these very immersive environments mm-hmm. that um, are not just upper end, like Ogilvy's, but mm-hmm. also you know, any kind of, of angle and, and indeed the manipulation of the senses. But, but what it, I mean, I guess what is troubling to some degree is that, that if, if Walmart is rocking, you know, um, and it does it with zero senses, you know, what does it mean to the reincorporation of the senses into an urban environment? Yeah. Or I think it's the people that count. I mean, I think that, that just as, as people who work at Walmart represent all walks of life, right. there's a, a real interesting mixing that yeah, goes on. Yeah, it's like Robert there. Ventura. I mean, mm-hmm. you go back to the, I mean, it's, it's like, why was Las Vegas? You know, right. it's the same type of, right. type of thing. Right. You could take a good and evil approach to it. Right. Or you could look at it as a modality of, right. of kind of, you know, of, of, of thinking right. about how society could be. I mean, yeah. there is some sort of... There is a know, sensory impression to New York. Yeah. I mean, there just yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah. Walmart yeah. tried that strategy. There are yeah. all these other strategies that are in between, I think, as well. Well. Mm-hmm. And you know you'll find sports stores, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with a, a distinctive kind of strategy mm-hmm. and, and so forth. So that that's one example. And Walmart works for that idea: mm-hmm. the lowest price is the law, or whatever right. it is. And it's that pure rationality that is mm-hmm. embedded there. But there are, nevertheless, like why the blue and red? If gray is the base color, why the blue and red? Why that sort of um, you know dome-like right. image on the on the facade? There are traces there nonetheless and it takes right. a very refined sense to actually right. detect how Walmart is undoubtedly a place of sensory stimulation as well. I have a question for the others about the change of architecture and what it might mean when you alter it. Uh, a very simple example, since we're talking about department stores, is uh, the corporation that owns Macy's bought Marshall Fields, which is mm. one of the great structures in Chicago, uh, also, by the way, Carson's, which is Louis Sullivan, is being saved, uh, although uh, it was Carson's, Peary Scott abandoned the store. They're fighting hard to save the building. But Marshall Fields was bought, and uh, a certain organization, a resistance organization, was formed because they changed the name of Marshall Fields to Macy's. Um, and I think uh, my own comment on it was it was the most successful merchandising uh, uh, decision since New Coke, uh, <laughs> to, which of course you most you know disappeared after uh, a while. That why they would force fields with which is an, a building of, of considerable interest in itself to change the name and what you all think about even sometimes minor changes in. Um, alteration of the structure and how that uh, uh, can have an enormous effect. Well, I mean, uh, I think the of interest is that we're having this discussion today about, you know, either experience or activity, whereas if we had this discussion during Venturi's time, we were talking about language and, mm-hmm. you know, Caesarean and myths, and we would be talking about architecture as a as a discipline that has to do with conveying meaning, you know, and 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 how through its elements, you know, produces meaning, you know, so the pediments or the domes or types of windows, um, and then the and the evolution, the failures, the successes of postmodernism and sort of this language approach to architecture, to um, a discussion we're having today, which is very much about um, something that seems. Uh, very direct in terms of the relationship with this whole meta language uh, discussion is, ha, has somehow uh, expired, right? Uh, but he brings up another very interesting point. Mm-hmm. But before I get to that, David, I hope your comparative study doesn't conclude that we need more boxes with gray. But you bring out another point, which is emotion. Mm-hmm. That that emotional connection with spaces 
with places mm -hmm. and with architecture mm -hmm. and designed objects mm -hmm. is something that um, very important, I believe. And that's I, what, in some ways, postmodernism, for all of its failings, served mm -hmm. as a kind of purgative mm -hmm. because it reminded mm -hmm. modernist architects, many of whom were not as bad as the postmodern. You know, always have to kill the father. Right, right. So, in fact, many of the great modernists were 100% into the senses. And mm -hmm. what postmodernism in the 60s criticizes is basically Sixth Avenue. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of corporate towers, right. uh, which now have their own supporters. You know, everything always comes around. Mm -hmm. But they did bring an idea that architecture should have a certain mm -hmm. an experience, and it should be you should use metaphor. It should have a certain way in. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a very valuable, mm -hmm. I think, that right. you know, that, that right. generation of architects, Robert right. Stern in New York, right. Robert Venturi in Philadelphia, right. that yeah. generation mm -hmm. of many more, Charles Moore, you know, Dean at Yale, they brought that idea back. Mm -hmm. That They tried to bring that root mm -hmm. of architecture back. Mm -hmm. And they succeeded in, right. in doing that. Right, you know. right. I mean, they... It, it, I mean, the, I think the last generation of modernists, people like Ulrich Franzen and uh, um, you know some of the people at, at SOM, yes. um, they were just overwhelmed with the sort of failures to bring the way into mm -hmm. architecture, this experiential gate into it, right, channel into it, and uh, and you see them struggling, and it's a it's a Herculean task, and there's some wonderful buildings from that time. Um, but it was a little bit of too late, too little. Um, um, and insofar as public spaces goes and urban design goes, I mean, I think that there was a sort of hierarchical uh, system set up where the visual was prime. There was mm -hmm. actually very little sensorial. I mean, right. if in New York, you look at Lincoln Plaza, I mean, Lincoln, what is it? Lincoln Plaza or Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center and, I mean, there's a fountain there that, which has a haptic dimension to it, right? It's just, it's, it's a very reduced. Um, but it doesn't seem like um, postmodernism necessarily introduced anything that wasn't the, the visual back into it. Uh, so. Um, but there is one, you know, even walking down this, what architecture does is because it's the only art that you, that physically engulfs you. Mm -hmm. When you're walking through a building, mm -hmm. the changing of light. The mm -hmm. feeling of the floor, mm -hmm. the sense of the walls, the right. shifting of movement of other people, right. that is, it, it can't be all visual. It's only all visual if you only look at architecture in a book, right. which a lot of our history students do. Right. But, you know, when you look at it right. at, at a book, yes, but it cannot, right. it cannot not be sensory if you walk through it. Right. Have, Even the bad ones. You know? yeah. so. I have two contradictory thoughts maybe you could clarify. One is that I have no question whatsoever that uh, the space or the architecture has an effect on one. And I very much remember some 15, 20 years ago, my wife and I stayed at the Mandarin Oriental in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, we both commented after being in the room for an hour that this was a particularly calming, relaxing, gave you a pleasant feeling, which hotel rooms usually don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was, but mm -hmm. it did, and other spaces have sometimes done the same thing. On the other side, the contradictory thought is the fact that in a certain way the architecture is irrelevant, because from what you described about the Prada store, it seems to me what's lacking there is the psychology. There is no attempt at being really welcoming, right. and so that it doesn't matter what Cool House did, because the Prada people essentially screwed it up. You go to the Apple store, it's full of life and activity, and uh, so in that sense it seems architecture is irrelevant, on the other sense it seems it's so totally relevant. Yeah, but actually the Prada story succeeded in what they really wanted to do, which is to give an aura of exclusivity. Mm -hmm. And, and the I mean, Apple Store is also presenting itself as egalitarian, but hardly is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, that equipment is quite expensive. There was a time, I mean, this, this sort of late modern architects. It's the message that they change. Yeah. This, this late modern architects, you know, um, they were just 
at the end of high modernism, right before, right when postmodernism was coming in, they were doing some very in interesting experiments. And the 70s is a fascinating time, the late 60s, 70s. But you have a lot of architecture that molds itself to the body, molds itself to the activity. Mm -hmm. So you have like conversation pits, mm -hmm. which we no longer have. But I, a, a conversation pit is, is a it's an adaptation of the physical environment to, to an activity, to a physical activity of sort of a heart, of gathering. Of, uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, the neutrality of the space is zero, but it's incredibly figured to an activity, right? So, um, uh, so it's interesting to talk about you know, modernism functionality and when you go from the functionality of how a corporation works to these late modern attempts where they were actually trying to configure an architecture just in terms of what the activities were and how people would use the space. And obviously, um, I mean, there are many reasons why, you know, that came apart, you know. But uh, you could be incredibly directive with the architecture and it could be incredibly limiting or incredibly productive also. So, um, you know, um, and some of these sort of highly configured architectures today, where you know the blobs and things like that. You know, I mean, um, well, those are actually not that contemporary. But you know, some of the highly articulate shapes, uh, the uh, Frank Gehrys we were just talking about in uh, Chicago and sort of like. Uh, one of the things that I think are uh, are sort of missing is this sort of direct relation between activity and shape. You know, uh, um, so, but the question is also in terms of many other parameters like sustainability and other cultures using a space, or you know, how how um, how much can a space be focused on a particular activity before it starts to become kind of useless? Um, Talking about Gary, I thought the and, and, and function and mm -hmm. space. I thought there was a problem with the Gary Museum, the Getty Museum in uh, Los Angeles, that he didn't put enough bathrooms. Oh, and well, I was uh, reminded that when they built the uh, research building at Cornell a few years yeah. ago, they again didn't put enough yeah. bathrooms. So it's always been a puzzle to me how an architect who's so involved in designing yeah. the space can actually forget yeah. not well, to actually, put enough. The Getty example is they predicted a certain number of people coming mm -hmm. and they designed the bathroom capacity for that. Mm -hmm. They proved to be far more successful than they knew. That's really what happened. They ended up getting, they predicted 500,000 people, they ended up getting like a million people that first year. The postmodernists provide flow max also. Right. <laughs> That's right. But if I could say one, one element that, that has, has struck me in, in, in terms of contemporary architecture, and, and here, um, you know, where do you feel at home? In a, a Bauhaus chair, in a building designed by Mies van der Rohe, or in you know, a grandmother's <laughs> Victorian parlor, where, um, you know, wh where do you feel most, most human? Now, um, Donald said that he's a pure modernist, and I really want to hear him on this, but I can say <laughs> one thing before, before saying that. Um, you know, to me, much of the postmodern turn in architecture was a kind of fragmentation of vision, um, mm -hmm. much like cubism was a fragmentation of linear perspective vision. Mm -hmm. But it was an escalation of a certain visual distraction, mm -hmm. and it uh, multiplied the planes of reference and so forth, mm -hmm. without actually engaging the mm -hmm. senses in mm -hmm. um, as meaningful a way as might have been, been possible. And so you find you know, Gary's streamlined uh, mm -hmm. kinds of, uh, of, of images, which are all very uh, well, smooth and, mm -hmm. and, and compelling in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but are these shapes to be felt or simply to be seen? Mm -hmm. And this is a question of well, what about texture in, mm -hmm. in architecture? What about uh, that quality of uh, a space that has to do with its materials and mm -hmm. the, the, what it manifests? Because one of the things about working with glass and steel is that they have no organic qualities whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They don't retain odors or uh, tastes uh, or, um, you know, and the sound mm -hmm. has a kind of hollowness compared mm -hmm. to other substances that you know, must have an impact mm -hmm. that way. Now, 
Donald, you, you sort of, I think, see some of those qualities of, of those building materials as actually having, I want to say, a transcendental function. That, well, that they it did was, at the time. I mean, and, you know, mm-hmm. the, glass, the glass building has gone through lots of different iterations. When it was first proposed, architects in the, in the, in the, right at the end of the First World War, it was genuinely believed that the metaphor would come true, that glass is physically transparent and it would produce a transparent society. We would be more open. You know, people actually, if you read the theoretical writing, the great architects took this with a grain of salt. They were like, forget it. But if you read the theoretical writing that the glass boxes, the glass housing projects were going to create an egalitarian, open society, and they took the literal meaning. Open, the building was open, so we would have an open society. Then that doesn't prove to be true, because if you think about it, how could it happen? You know, When it comes to America, it becomes a style. It becomes a kind of a corporate style. And it, it loses a lot of this sort of egalitarian, socialist, you know, utopian movement in Europe. And it becomes Leverhaus, which becomes a sort of a corporate symbol. And Lewis Mumford, famously the critic, architecture critic, the greatest architecture critic, once famously said, you know, well, it made sense. They made soap, so they wanted a building that looked clean. You know, it was... <laughs> but Mumford also did praise the building because by setting the glass box back, Lever House, you know, is at 52nd and I think it is Park Avenue, you brought sunlight in. Mm-hmm. This was a good thing. It broke, you know. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, everybody copies it. Mm-hmm. Okay, then it becomes a symbol of corporate... Anonymity, you know. Then it becomes another meaning. Now all of a sudden it's back again. See, it's very interesting. Now all of a sudden, I don't know what it was. Those, it was those damn Richard Meyer towers on Perry Street mm-hmm. that suddenly, what everything that's old is new again. Suddenly now, it's chic again to have a glass box. Mm-hmm. And now they're back again, and they have the kind of forties meaning of. Progressiveness. Now, they've never been utopian in America. Mm-hmm. And I would love, I mean, I'm doing a small exhibition on an architect that's doing one on the High Line. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, I would love to live in those floor to ceiling glass mm-hmm. walls. Mm-hmm. I've been in, I was raised in Chicago, and I've been in Mies van der Rohe's famous 860 880 Lakeshore Drive. I've got to tell you, when you're in that space and that glass is floor to ceiling and you look out on Lake Michigan, there is nothing like it. It is spectacular. And again, it's a visual spectacle. It is a visual spectacle. Eight, and six and, and Lex, the building one. Yes. The now they're all back to them. The meaning of the glass building has shifted. And it's always morphing. It's fascinating how it's always changing its meanings. And when it became... Because the postmodernists hated it. That's what they hated. The glass anonymous tower that represented, you know... The anonymous corporation. Yeah. Well, I mean, they also hated the the uh, glass tower because it, it had created an urbanism that was uh, very sort of anti-human in a sense. Yeah. There were no stores at the bottom. Right. It was it the was, urbanistic quality. It was also, like, it was a sheer copying of them all. Right. But it was lacking all the sensory aspects of the city that we're sort of discussing now. Um, and it's interesting how you know this new architecture of s- scaffolding for activities. It is using glass and steel, but they are sort of uh, sort of pushing it to the limit, so all those activities can sort of ooze mm-hmm. through the glass and metal and sort of inform the spaces again. Mm-hmm. A lot of the glass towers in New York are not doing that well, and they're not creating a sort of urban public space mm-hmm. that has t- you know different programs, different activities, different senses, different smells. Um, but the most productive of this new type of architecture, that sort of understand that to some degree. Uh, but it's still confounding that all this architecture is coming up again because the biggest critique of it was how it destroyed the city, and it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to be a reflective practice. Mm-hmm. That you know, what can we do to do a glass tower that doesn't destroy the city? Mm-hmm. That reflection is not there, and yeah. that was the most troublesome part about. The sort of this new modernity, you mm-hmm. know, and all these projects in China and all these other projects is that it lacks complete reflection and completely uh, overlooks some of the experiments of the 60s and 70s mm-hmm. or even some of the lessons of modern of postmodernism. So this total lack of reflection um, 
I don't think has to do with either invention or emotion or the senses. I think it has to do with a historical lesson that eventually grounds itself in urban life. But that's how I think the senses come back. It's also about the climb. I mean, what's life now, is. these are all these high-end condominiums. I mean, in New York City, they're all, they're only being built as these highly private, high-end yeah. For, for their high-end condominiums yeah. where people are probably not even going to live. It goes back to, <laughs> it goes back to Jane Jacobs, really. Yes, I mean, yes. The, you have the destruction right. of this indigenous right. life. Yeah. You know? Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, I'm fascinated by your comment that many, many years ago you lived in this hotel and for a short period of time, and yet you recall that very, very clearly even today, so that there is some potential for architecture to be enabling certain emotional kinds of experiences that, and we talk about a whole range of buildings like cathedrals or the Taj Mahal or other such which give us that kind of feeling and uh, the ability to create that feeling. Not that every piece of architecture, which is going back to your question, that has to be that way. We do also need certain kind of um, neutral, and cleansing kinds of spaces as well. And it, you know, it, in the hotel, well, well, making coffee this morning, you use that machine, you press a button and it says cleaning time, <laughs> take 30 seconds, and it makes all these noises and water comes out. But you, we also need the, the ability to cleanse ourselves every once in a while in order to be able to experience those emotions that we tend to enjoy. Right. But there is a whole range of emotions as well. I mean, you can listen. Also, them. I think far better at emotion uh, development is the interior design field. Well, not not solely though. Yeah, no. I mean, urban I design. I think architecture. Can... I think architects. If we're talking all about architecture, but I think we have to talk about interior design is really significant because that's where the the body really meets the environment more clearly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think, or, or if you don't think about disciplines, just in terms of the making of environment, you know, at different scales, I think it's also, I mean, it, there, um, things work at different scales better than others. Definitely at the interior scale, textures, and mm -hmm. the are, are, are quite significant. How much time do we have? Do we have questions from the audience? You can have questions from the oh, audience. I mean, I, yeah. it, it might be nice to see if there's, are they, th does anybody have any questions? Well, okay. if, if oh. you all have any Could you come up to the microphones? Because we're not going to get any pickup for those listening in from Bulgaria. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Matthew Longworth. I work here at the Philoctety Center. I just wonder if any of you have any reaction to... There was an article in the New York Times magazine a couple of weeks ago about the instant city. And um, uh, I've been thinking about it as you've been talking, especially uh, uh, with respect to Dr. Weiner's comments about uh, Marshall Fields and the attachments that, that, that clearly developed between the citizenry in this building and, and how, one, uh, how those attachments proceed and how they might proceed in a city that's springing up literally from the ground uh, in, you know, from the desert in Dubai or in China or, you know, and it's an, a completely new urban space. And is that is something that can even be programmed in any way or do you just have to wait for the smells to start rising? <laughs> I would think that these, uh, it would take a while for people to feel this is my space. Mm -hmm. uh, this is imposed by they, the... They personalize it after yeah. a while. Yeah. It'll take a while, though, I mean, to, uh, when you build these gigantic uh, structures and places and uh, 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 population areas, some of which are very small, that uh, it's the people with all the money are doing this, not me in most cases, uh, but I'm sure others, <clears throat> that's the part I got out of skimming. I, I was disappointed, actually, with that. So the, is, the question is, do people who live there, do they feel that they can personalize? Yeah. Has it happened in Brasilia? Well, that's a good question, yeah. yeah. Um, I was in Vienna. I mean Brasilia, I mean the capital city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It's 20 some years old now, isn't it? Yes. The only reports that I have are just the, the massive failure because yeah. of the impersonality of mm -hmm. the facades and the impossibility of a street culture to actually mm -hmm. take shape. In Brazil, you, you have to have a street culture, mm -hmm. the cafes and so forth being mm -hmm. key. But if I could just uh, give an example, um, Vienna is famous for its coffee houses, and, and the coffee 
Coffee House is, of course, an interesting public-private institution. It's said that because apartments were so small and so cold that people gravitated to the Coffee House as a space of uh, both being able to engage in solitary activities like reading the newspaper and engage in exchange and actually work. There are many writers, novelists, who actually Great gave cards. us their address, as we know. Um, the, the Coffee House, which is, a, I think, a delightful thing. They're also, interestingly, the last place that you can smoke cigarettes in Europe right now. That um, So fearful was the uncoupling of coffee and cigarettes that mm. uh, I think every other jurisdiction I've been to, mm. you notice the bans, <laughs> beginning with Ireland. Uh, but there is one place where that was somehow kept. The Coffee together. Houses, the in, coffee Vienna. houses yeah. in Vienna. Now, um, what's interesting about them is that uh, the reason for this discussion is that Vienna is actually engaged in a process of trying to figure out what has made it the cultural capital it is and how it can attract creative industries to um, Vienna in, in future and they see that as being a development strategy. They therefore had a five census call two years ago mm-hmm. of proposals that would actually analyze the sensory ambience of Vienna to figure out what it was that made it such a creative space to begin with. How could it produce such great music um, and such other cultural like Klimt, you know, the, the visual arts as well. And it's trying to work out you know, what is it that actually accounts for the ambience, the character, the atmosphere. And this is important because now that you can work anywhere in the world, because we're all connected by the internet, you can actually choose your place of residence. And and again, Vienna wants to attract people. Well, what they were doing was actually using liquid gas chromatography of coffee houses, taking a snapshot (laughs) of the qualities of the air. Only in a German seeking. I know, I know. know. But they were were doing both a sort of an ethnographic analysis of what the qualities of interaction were in these spaces, and you know, trying to figure out what exactly the quotient of smoke, cigarette smoke, <laughs> and, and the sweet, you know, uh, sacra torta and so forth, uh, you know, was in order to, to, to give this this mix. And so I think it, it, it's interesting. It's, it's for a commercial purpose. It's to try and attract you know, people, creative people, to Vienna. So they um, decided that it's all rooted in the coffee. That's but, what they decided. They, no, but they, but they, they think that it's, a, it's the mix. Okay, so oh, they're really? looking at <laughs> they're looking at the music. They're looking at their, the, the whole point was that instead of just saying, you know, how do we attract film and other yeah. designer types, they said, okay, what is the sensory ambience of Vienna? Um, and uh, really, many of these things go back to the fantasy actor, But uh, this was what they were trying to, to, to work through. So this was one mm. project that was looking at the, 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 the smell and the, the feeling of Vienna. What are distinctive about its haptic contours? Right. I mean, what is, uh, what is fascinating about this question is that it also brings sort of both poles of it. If, if you look at New York and the commissioner plan from 1861, I think it is, there, in a way, it was an eastern city. You know, there was there were thousands of blocks laid out that were in there to begin with, mm-hmm. um, and the idea of it is that you created an organization that afforded a lot of different functions to be in direct contact with each other. I mm-hmm. mean, New York doesn't have piazzas, doesn't have parks, uh, the narrow sidewalks. <coughs> the public life is the grid. The public life is the is the circulation. The public life is this sort of infrastructure. You know, infrastructure of commerce of, of uh, circulation. So. Um, if you would look at you know how to create an eastern city, I think uh, you know two very great models would be Vienna and they're sort of trying to figure out what the percentage of smoke to you know <laughs> caffeine is. Uh, but also you know you can look at New York as a very successful example where you've created a system that affords complexity, that affords variety, that affords diversity. Uh, you know Rem Kul has famous book of um, uh, about New York has a very funny. Um, Drawing of two naked men with boxing gloves, wet hair, eating oysters in a locker room, and it's it's a paradigm of the New York Athletic Club, which had a swimming pool, had a boxing club, had an oyster bar, <laughs> and had all these things. So you know, so through the through the elevator. These uh, two men were able to take all the functions, and they are represented naked, boxing gloves, eating oysters. You know, so, the, so, the, so the confluence of all these activities, sort of. Uh, being brought mm-hmm. by the system of the elevator to the vertical com- profile and, yeah. and 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 that's an analogy of the city that the city is not unlike the New York Athletic Club where you know mm-hmm. where a very fluid well 
not, I mean, now it's a pretty sad infrastructure system, but at the time a very successful infrastructural system with streets and grids sort of afforded every block to be different and every block to be intrinsically connected to the next mm -hmm. one, so you had this variety and this quality of life. So the question is, if, if the eastern city uh, were to be designed in a systemic fashion, if somebody sort of could come up with a with a follow up to the New York sort of ultimate viability and uh, intertwinedness would be great. Or if somebody were to come up with uh, something as sensorially potent, you know, as the Vienna coffee place from which everything could stem from, uh, I think those would be like two amazing models of. of a sort of urban building. David's comment was fascinating because my wife and I had lunch in Cafe Savarsky in the Neue Galerie. And we've been uh, in Vienna a couple of times in the last few years, and we said, the, the newspapers are here, the coffee is here, the dishes are here, the spetzel, et cetera, mm -hmm. the soccer tour. Why isn't this feel right? It does not feel like we're in Vienna. Uh, and we didn't realize they didn't have enough gas chromat <laughs> chromatography but study. Also, or what. Yeah, what was actually was it was dirty. I mean, people, Viennese themselves refer to the coffee house as a dirty place. It's not clean. You know, it's not uh, the fast food restaurant. And the grime, the patina, is actually part of the experience of the place. And in a way, as a North American, I felt a little bit, um, you know. That's uh, my experience. One, like that's the Naples experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was. It was it was a bit of overload, you know, for, for, for me, although I could see how the exchanges, you know, mm -hmm. were indeed very important. There was one of the people, persons that I was with, uh, he took us to um, the coffee house where he had always gone in the evening as a student at the university with 20 or 25 other friends, and each time, um, you know, that was their living room, in effect. I want to throw in another commercial for psychoanalytic theory just for a moment. <laughs> there is a concept called a transitional object. Uh, which is the teddy bear or the blankie or this that a lot of small children have. And uh, it has to feel right, it has to smell right, it has to be held in a certain way. And of course, the mothers know that the worst mistake they can make is throw it in the washing machine. <laughs> when it gets dirty, uh, it has to be just that way. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there isn't some kind of additional factor besides the gas chromatography and the, uh, et, et cetera that relates to our deepest. Uh, internal functioning mm -hmm. in some kind of way in this familiar environment uh, that may well be a factor. Mm -hmm. We have another question up here. I'm Saul Robbins. I'm actually the photographer of the oh. therapist chairs that are outside. Um, I have a question that I think is fitting to follow in the, along this one. I'm wondering what your assessment is of current architectural practice from a psychological point of view, like your psychological assessment or um, analysis would be of prevalent uh, architectural design values. It seems that the last 10 or 20 years, especially with the rise in multimedia experience on the streets, has been to overstimulate us, and yet at the same time we're losing our sensitivity to all that stimulus. And so you're talking sort of about a multisensorial experience, but the street becomes a place where, especially now with iPods and telephones, we're becoming more and more removed and I'm wondering, on a psychological level, how would you characterize what's going on, not just in the United States, but really around the world, maybe the U.S. is prevalent in that or not? And the other question is about most of the examples you're talking about, such as the house overlooking Lake Michigan, is a very sort of elite mm -hmm. um, experience, but what sort of... Um, sensitivity is being given to more the working class or even the middle class for their accessibility and really their their equal entitlement to have and enjoy a multisensorial lifestyle that doesn't have to be one that's so far removed from a reality. Thank you. Is that mine? <laughs> uh, I think that a lot of people's inner lives are so... Um, fraught with pain that they do their best to have so much external stimulation uh, coming in that they don't feel. I think this has to do with the ghetto blaster radio going is so loud that it, most people find it very, very difficult and all kinds of other things going on uh, so that uh, you are so preoccupied and so much of your psychological energy is involved uh, with perception that it blocks out the inner experience. 
that would be a quick answer. And I think uh, from the point of view of space and the city, I think one, uh, many of the great people going back to Caesar and others uh, knew that if the lower and middle, uh, the working class or the unemployed, et cetera, what do you do for them? Uh, you can't just build a coliseum. You have parks. Uh, and you, um, you have Olmsted. Uh, you have uh, something to provide an environment so that the extreme stimulation of the workplace or the mm -hmm. city, uh, it be, it, there's a refuge. And I mean, also the, you know, like, what else has happened is the, the towers in the park, you know, this sort of this idea of public housing, of these isolated towers that were meant to have gardens at the base. They have a very bad reputation in New York. But actually, I work three days a week at the Museum of City in New York, and there are many, many of these housing projects nearby. They're actually really good. Many of them are very good. Because what hap what's happened is over the years, people have formed garden clubs, yep. mm -hmm. and actually this idea that they sit in this barren, you know, oasis, I'm sure that's true in many of them. But in many of the other ones, they actually, in New York at least, they work. Many of them do, and it's very interesting to see how they work. And it has to do with people individualizing things, like I said, the garden club. You know, and, and there'll be fences that'll say, please don't walk on the grass, and they keep them up. It's actually, there is a neighborhood that has emerged in many of these developments. I mean, the, 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 uh, the sort of working class and uh, urbanism it, and the rise of modernity is interesting because, I mean, uh, many cities, particularly now, like the cities of, of the South, you know, uh, which are, you know, places like Mexico City, like Sao Paulo, they're getting, you know, 10,000 right. inhabitants per day. And um, they are creating accretions to the city that are purely organic. There's mm -hmm. nothing planned to them. So they're also some type of eastern city. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not the Dubai or it's not the, uh, the, the uh, China city. They're, you know, uh, there's a way of life that is becoming extinct, which is rural life, and mm -hmm. everybody's flocking yeah. to the city. So, uh, the type of urbanism that is being built by these people, you know, what code it has, what sort of diagramming it has of public spaces, what the sensory perceptions are there. Um, I think there are very few people that are, have been able to sort of make sense of it all, mm -hmm. except that it's happening and it's right. happening fast. Uh, um, so that's sort of organic growth, right? The uh, sort of planned growth for the workers, you know, which starts in, you know, um, with industrialization and the palimpsestry, and then you get the towers in the park. I mean, what I've, what I've always found troublesome about it, even though some of these projects may or may not work now, is the, is the lack of uh, organic nature mm. to the transformation. So, you know, with urban renewal in the 60s, you had the destruction of entire neighborhoods that were very haptic, mm. that were very intense, that were very sort of uh, multicultural and had a multiplicity of functions in them, and those were taken out for the towers, mm -hmm. right? So uh, to the, I think there's, there's a lack of thinking about uh, operative ways to deal with, uh, you know, Working class house, you know, working class class. Mm -hmm. But generally, the sort of um, the those experiences uh, are a lot richer in a sensorial aspect mm -hmm. uh, from from what I've read in some of these aspects. So I don't know. It's a we had another question from the lady. Who's been very patient. Why don't you go? You've been wanting to. You've been wanting to talk, and you. I know you were anxious. To, to okay, and the reason. I speak is because what you said excited me very much. The fact that you were in that hotel room and you felt so calm and peaceful. I lived in Sedona, Arizona, which by itself is a very calming place, um, but I did residential real estate there exclusively because I wanted to get into all those magnificent homes <laughs> that were just such perfect examples of architecture to me. Um, and architects were very challenged in Sedona because the topog uh, topography was very, very challenging. The demands of the clients were challenging. It was a spiritual community. The clients wanted feng shui or whatever their um, desires were. And it was very important that the homes be built in concert with the land. 
and they were they were just gorgeous. In the 12 years that I did residential real estate there, what I noticed was the happy homes, the spiritual homes, the calming homes are the ones that sold in a heartbeat. You know, the ones that didn't have that feeling didn't sell as well or as quickly or for as much money. So when I, but it's the truth, when I went into a home that had that aura uh, and I showed that home to my clients, I insisted that they sit in that home and I stood behind them so they'd have the sensation of being alone. I wanted them to experience what I experienced and it helped me sell homes. And it, it, but, and it does exist. That feeling is real and it does exist. Yeah, but this is where the extrasensorial, thing, and, and this is a term that is actually very interesting. What is the extrasensorial? I think that you're putting your finger on it, your, the, the pulse. Um, and you know that is it a combination of the senses, you know, a, a kind of fusion of them, uh, or is it a, a, you know, a transcendence of sensory experience? And what you're describing, I think, is, is very much what that is. But that's where we have to analyze next. We need not only something on the architecture and the senses, but you know what this idea of an extrasensorial might be, in that it isn't analyzable in terms of a liquid gas chromatography <laughs> machine and what it might be able to identify. But it might be all those things combined mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. the sun light and with the knowledge that when I'm in Vienna then I bring a certain knowledge I see it for its for Strauss for opera for you know writing for what I'm saying I bring to it mm-hmm. certain intellectual associations well, not, that translate in I think that was, that's key though the, the sense is we shouldn't think of them as passive as just being yeah. receptors um, think of the idea of the evil eye for example the idea of the evil eye is precisely that sight projects and and this idea of the senses as receptors is not right the senses are sort of sites of interchange. Mm-hmm. And when you talk about interactivity, I think mm-hmm. that's precisely it. They're not just receptors. They are engaging us with the environment. And the limits of your senses are the limits of your world. You exist all the way out there to the point that you your perception stops. So these are ways in which you know, what you bring to an experience, mm-hmm. right. how your experience what of you Vienna is informed, yeah. you know, is, is very much a part of it, that your senses are educated in that way. Um, we could be doing a lot more to educate our senses, uh, um, you know, especially smell and taste, you know, where do the nation's schools have to do with those senses and even touch, again, gymnastics or gym, is that really an education of touch? Um, Those (laughs) senses have been systematically underdeveloped, which is why they are such good targets for marketing and advertising. Uh, They're so uneducated that we can be led by them in all Hmm. kinds of ways that um, we would have defense but also interest if they were more more developed. Conversely, getting back to her question, your question, I'd I'd be wondering about the sellability of places where major crime did occur, like the Polanski you know, the, 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 sure. these, these, these houses of crime. Fear. You know, I mean, I'm being facetious. No, I know. Obviously. <laughs> I'm fascinated by this uh, example that you gave of Sedona, but I think you put your finger on it. You mentioned Feng Shui, and uh, that's an ancient set of principles for design. Similarly, there's Vastu Shastra, and there's a city mm-hmm. in Iowa that's been designed along those principles. Um, some people are starting to look back once again at those ancient principles as to what it is about the way that they went about designing that had a different component to them, that is extrasensorial, that has an emotional bonding, a place attachment, and an ability to relate that is lacking in many of the modern designs. Mm. And a way uh, that gives you a sort of a formulaic approach if you want to follow the formula, but there is also the ways in which you can address those formulas in the way you design that gives you that kind of an experience, the feel that you got. And that I think perhaps we should go back and take a look at those principles once again. Um, the bathroom, you know, in true feng shui, the toilet is close to the floor. Uh-huh. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> I know. Um, to me, but, you know, it worked for a lot of people because a lot of folks were like that. Yeah. Dave, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, my name is David Act. I study cognitive science, so I'll, my question from the ancient to the to the most modern, I think, goes to um, some of the recent research that has gone on in the past 15 years about the role of emotion in cognition, which I thought was something that came up in a, in a couple of points that were made. And um, my curiosity is, uh, well, A, what is the, the contribution that this 
budding research field is going could make to the, dev- the design of environments. And also, I mean, even to go back to the notion of these ancient principles, how is it that they address these um, qualities of cognition and of, of mental life that are only now being recognized as topics for study in laboratories and in that sort of setting? Because I think, um, you know, there's this very profound effect that holy places have on people consistently over time that, um, you know, is not just a cultural thing, but is also something very much directly involving the the, the sensory experience, but also the emotional and decision-making experience that someone goes through. You know, how do they attach themselves to these, you know, these these entities, you know, religious entity, and so, you know, that's... There are several modern cities. Um, one example is Oroville, which is in... in oh, our son was there. Ah, okay. Where is the city? This in is southern a place, India. A place in southern India. What's, what's it? It's uh, Oroville. Okay. Uh, and so there are places that are being constructed. It doesn't have to be very old, but then they are they are following certain ideas and principles, some religious and some not necessarily so that incorporate this idea that we have a certain connection with the land. Uh, There are concepts in different cultures. Uh, For example, genfuke is is a concept that's used by the Japanese that gets into this relationship that we have with the land. There are ways in which we can capture some of those, and and they have been used, and that's how you get back to those old principles Mm -hmm. as to how they have been used. it is easy to dismiss some of this work as superstitious, um, but if you take a look at these principles, then perhaps it has a set of ideas and notions about building. Because we were talking about you know this connection with places, and here we tend to design in some ways on a very psychological level. I like col- this color red, or I like a particular space. And we tend not to be very analytical about it. In other words, we would talk to the architect, and most architects wouldn't take you much further than that, but to ask you what it is that you like, and perhaps you'll have some magazines, etc., that you'll say, well, here's some idea of what I would like to have. These people are thinking about the client and the designer relationship from a very different perspective. And it has to do with a whole complex set of relationships. Feng Shui, for example, is supposed to have nine levels, and I can't, I can only probably say I'm at four or something like that, so I cannot speak very well about it. But there are ideas about how a building has a particular character, and a human who's going to be occupying that building also is given an attributed character, and that there has to be this harmony between these two characteristics. And the way they go about bringing it, that's the interesting part of design. So there's a lot of potential there that that we haven't explored. And that has to do with that emotional, deeper emotional connection with places. If I can add to that, the word sense is an interesting one in that it refers both to sensation and signification, uh, both feeling and meaning. And I think that what you're bringing out is precisely now, because we're doing so many of these choices about interior design on the basis of hedonistic qualities, uh, just the pleasure, we're not getting at the signification. Um, and one of the, these principles that you're addressing actually has to do with is signification, the ordering of things, and not just the, the pleasing nature of things. So now, the senses have always been suspicious in the Western tradition because they are sources of pleasure. And you know, pleasure has always been suspect. But uh, the point that even Aristotle recognizes is that the, the senses also lead us to knowledge and understanding to to, to meaning. And I think it's therefore, to me, my reaction to cognitive science is that we need to expand our understanding of the sensorium, of that sense-making activity, that before we go to cognitive models and see them playing out in various kinds of ways, we actually have to attend to our senses and novel ways of using them, which we can acquire through studying across cultures and finding out what that activity of sense-making actually involves. So it is a new methodology. I think that that's what's radical about your calling this roundtable, a new methodology which is um, opening up just that that domain of sensation and perception and in 
instead of um, going underneath it or beyond it, um, letting the senses play off each other and following their their various travels. And, and that, I think, can lead to new understandings of cognition. Just as an example, there are, there are tribes, uh, tribal peoples in, in South America, the, the Suya, who will say, not I see when they mean I understand, but they say I hear. Um, and they will say of a visual pattern, like a weaving, when they know it, um, it is in my ear. Now, surely it is in their eye, but no, it is in my ear. And, and this different centering of cognition um, in the ear, as opposed to a visualizing kind of brain, has implications for social interaction um, and for the feeling you know, one has for the world. Now, as an anthropologist, I map these kinds of transformations and the meaning and, and use of the senses across cultures, and it becomes fascinating to explore you know, what the senses are good for. We need a user's guide for the senses that takes us beyond you know, the kind of psychologism or medicalization that we typically find uh, to begin to open up those, those possibilities. You'd be interested in this um, idea of synesthesia. Perhaps you know about this. Yeah, the ability to... Uh, and the scene has, was identified as something problematic, wasn't it, initially? Yeah. But now people are realizing that synesthesia is the source, in some measure, of uh, extreme creativity. And this ability to transform... You should define it. Uh, oh, knows maybe you should define it then. Well, it's a experiencing cross-sensation, so that... Uh, I, one of my friends uh, in medical school had it. He, a cello was brown when it played. Mm -hmm. Cellos play brown. It's the experience of something in a different uh, sensory uh, modality. Sensory modality. Uh, it's, and it's sometimes found in schizophrenic uh, patients, so that gave it a bad name. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it's. Uh, well, well, were you. Did I interrupt? Well, this. Uh, um, I guess his name was Saitovic or Saitovic? Yeah. 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 So he had written this book, um, and in this he describes his first patient that he was uh, invited to his neighbor's house for dinner and the neighbor was uh, cooking and gave him a little sample to taste and said looked at his expression and said oh I know what's wrong the chicken is too pointed <laughs> <laughs> but that's in part what you're referring to mm -hmm. is that the ability to actually mix the senses and the ability to then transform mm -hmm. in that into a creative endeavor and innovative endeavor. Uh, a remixing, precisely. Yes. That's the, the man who tasted shapes is the name of That's that, right. that book. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, how do you taste a shape? Um, that kind of, of transfer is, is intriguing in terms of the, the possibilities that it opens up. How do you, you know, visualize a sound or how do you hear a color? Uh, and synesthesia is a medical condition, very, very rare. One in 200, one in 2,000, one in... Uh, it varies the estimates, um, but different cultures, in my findings, um, seem to focus different synesthesias. And so um, colored hearing is the most common one. Actually, color grapheme synesthesia is the most common one in the West, uh, where a, a particular letter has a particular color. Um, but what if you didn't grow up with a, a fridge with colored letters on it. You know, what if you grew up in an oral society? You know, would, you, uh, would that be the most common form of synesthesia? Or you know, when, you, when you hear a word instead of seeing it, uh, what other forms might, might synesthesia take? So I agree that crossing of the senses is actually um, a, a fascinating area. Yeah. yeah, and hearing it at the same time. Lightning is, is one of those beautiful examples of synesthesia um, that... No, no, we it, we we broadcasting. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, my name is Claude Sampton. I'm an architect, and I teach a class, a course in architecture, where one of the early sessions, I have them do a blind walk. So they go in partners, one just eyes closed or covering, and the other one taking them around the city. And it's amazing, within 20 minutes, what comes out in terms of sound. In ter you know, I have them with uh, textures, feeling the textures, smells, going into pizza parlors, and, you know, or, or just passing by different shops and being able, within 20 minutes, to tell what is in that 
shop. And it stimulates amazing conversation when they come back, uh, you know, before they start actually thinking about architecture and about design. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that I designed a facility for the blind uh, upstate New York and I had to think about all of the other, as an architect, you know, mostly, of course, visually, but here had to think about sound, had to think about textures, had to think about smells with uh, water fountains, with uh, fragrant plants, this kind of thing. And I, I said to the director of the facility, I said, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a new thing for me to think of with these other, uh, um, you know, senses. And he said, but don't, you also have to think of the visual because these people are going to ask the staff, what does it look like? You know, so you can't totally disregard the, the visual in this. Anyway. So, okay. it's, it's interesting that you're so successful with your experiment. Uh, our assignment of getting the students to go around the city doing this. Um, one, just one example from my own teaching, I ask students to, like next class, come in barefooted. Mm -hmm. And not a single student takes me up on that offer. I come in barefooted, but they don't. <laughs> so that's one. Um, another point, just as a, I'm thinking way back when I was practicing, um, we were designing a resort on the beach. And so there was this ocean that was the salt water and the sand. And it occurred to me that we have to give this haptic experience. So I, I set up a swim pool with some sand gardens right near the beach, but in the hotel so that people could sort of translate that experience of the ocean to their own you know, personal kind of, can I have a shower here or can I have a swim here? But Thank similarly, in, in one of the interesting things about museums um, has been that often they can construct models for the blind so that they can actually feel what is otherwise you know, represented in a two-dimensional picture. Um, but sighted visitors have actually found that to help them as well, probably because it slows them down. And instead of just racing past, they take the time to feel. But actually apprehending the form mm -hmm. of a painting, um, Duchamp's new descending a staircase <laughs> or this kind of thing, you know, through the tactile as well as the visual, um, doubles the meaning. But also there are slight differences and things that you would note in one sense that you might not note in another. And so it's precisely the idea that the senses don't necessarily line up. Um, and that when you do bring down one, what are the others capable of? that I think it makes for that to be such a brilliant exercise for people to experiment with other sensory ratios right. and see what they can perceive. What, what was interesting to me is that, um, you know, when you're walking in the street and a bus or a truck passes you, you know, you know it's maybe five feet away or six feet away. When, you're, when your vision isn't there, when it's just the sound, you, you step back. You really, it's very frightening to have a bus coming five feet away from you, you know, whereas ordinarily you say, well, it's, I'm perfectly safe. But with sound, it's, you know, it magnifies all of it. We have, we have another question here. You. Hi, I'm Barbara Bruni. I'm a psychoanalyst from the Boston Psychoanalytic Institute. And to bring it back to the realm of the... Um, the body structure, the physical structure of a building, and the parallels between the psychological structure of people. Uh, I was just reading uh, Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence, and, which is about uh, New York and, and the New York society of the turn of the century. And when you were speaking about the grid of New York, it was a very small grid at that time. I mean, if you lived about 44th Street, you were considered to be out in the boonies someplace. But the city was filled with all kinds of stimuli, but because the same people did the same things with the same people all the time. In fact, a lot of it was unrecognized by them. There was almost no reaction to it. It was just a very ritualized kind of interaction that happened. And Edith Wharton, they, at, at one point, they were bemoaning the, the new people who are coming in and bringing change into the city. And one of the characters who has uh, railed against what she calls trends, that uh, the observation by the author is that uh, the way of New York was to not notice the trend while it was coming in, and then once it was in place, to behave as though it had always been there. And uh, I think there is a parallel between that and um, our patients sometimes that you want to be 
aware of what's happening, to be curious about what's happening when you're talking about cognition. I think it's very important to have this curiosity and awareness of what's changing and what's happening to the architecture, what's happening to a city, and how we all interact with it as well as how people interact with themselves. That's a fascinating uh, observation, et cetera. And it reminded me of something we had a discussion with some other analysts about, and none of us had a very good idea how to explain this phenomenon. It's that you have something in your office, say a picture or something on your desk, and you've had it there for eight years. And a patient walks in and says, oh, you've got a new picture um, in that very familiar space. Uh, and that, I'm sure, is different from each person, but it's common enough. I think all of us uh, clinicians have run into that. Uh, why today did they notice it, et cetera? I wanted to comment about selling houses in Sedona. Uh, you are in the market? Yeah. You taking a plane? Yeah. And uh, something about Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and that's that, uh, and the idea of the calm uh, in certain environment, and even the idea of the emotional and the cognitive uh, three questions all, all at once. Uh, that Wright had an enormous capacity to, to be empathic and f figure out what, we're talking about house clients now, what somebody wanted and what would please them, et cetera. And, uh, was dazzling to some people, and uh, some of you may know of the Prairie Avenue Bookshop, uh, which has a national reputation. It's on Wabash in Chicago, and the owner of it is an architect. And I got to meet him through my r research, and when he was young, he interviewed 40 owners of Wright Houses, and every single one he swore of the 40 people or families he interviewed thought that their house was Wright's favorite. <laughs> and that there were many other defects in other houses. But because, and the way uh, we, we put that together was that the Wright was the genius at being able to pick up what people wanted. And then, of course, he would come in after uh, the, everything was uh, completed, and there was a famous story where he did the furnishings, etc., et and came to visit. And um, while the hostess was out of the room, I think it was, he rearranged all the furniture the way he wanted it to be, because he still considered it his house. Uh, yet, so there is a certain capacity, a kind of empathy that can be used when designing. And, but what Wright seemed to have personally, which affected a lot of people, was that, uh, and this was why at lunch we I questioned about the, please don't take away my cubicle, is that he took away walls and cubicles and compartments and boxes, and in fact, called the modernists the glass box boys, uh, and had these wonderful spaces where the houses and the prairie uh, school houses often merged with the environment, even to materials, colors that he favored, and uh, the room, there were a few dividers between between rooms, and I associated this again from a psychoanalytic, uh, uh, somewhat speculative position, that it takes us back to early in life where there aren't, you have to do this, you can't do that, et cetera. And there's a certain kind of appeal to a lot of people uh, so that some of uh, right spaces have this, uh, or the um, Johnson Wax Building in Wisconsin, which is this. Uh, wonderful uh, uh, office type space where there are no cubicles. Mm -hmm. Nobody's forced to be in their compartment. So what you were talking about, don't take away my cubicle as it's a bit of a status uh, symbol. It took me a long time to get this cubicle. But I think the confining and, and Sedona, the pleasure, whether they are more natural uh, houses in some ways, and people feel that you don't go to Sedona uh, if you're not interested in the surround. I think we have one more question, and that's going to be it. It's interesting. In America, we always get back to Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Dr. Rosen. I'm at Mount Sinai, a psychiatrist. One major impediment to psychoanalytic understanding of architecture is the lack of the architect's fantasies. 
But when you know the fantasies, it is interesting, but not terribly useful. Frank Lloyd Wright talked about the windmill in Spring Green, and he, he, that he said it's like Romeo embracing Juliet. And when you look at the uh, structure, it doesn't look anything mm -hmm. like anybody embracing anybody else. But to him, it did. Do you have an answer? Oh, well, no, I mean, I would just, it, it, it just been going through my mind through the last series of questions that um, uh, architecture, in a way, it's, it's not construction. Yeah, it's annotational art. So you're, there's a lot of, um, it's an abstraction of reality that becomes annotational art that produces a series of documents that produces a building, right? That's another way to see architecture. So um, as annotational art, there's a lot of disconnects between reality, both at the, at the front end and at the back end, just in terms of the fantasy side of it or what's going through your mind. To, it becomes annotational art, to then it becomes a building. And there's a lot of productive friction in the abstraction of reality to um, the means of the architect back to the building itself. Um, so, uh, of course, there, there's a very famous quote by uh, uh, James Sterling, was a very famous uh, British architect, and he, uh, and he taught at Yale, and he taught at many other places, and he used to say, I don't care if you wear red socks while you're designing, you know, the, in a sense that, the, that your motivation would or would not come out of the building, which is an interesting question for psychoanalysis. You know, um, in the, so how how accurate can can one's desire be traced to the building form? Um, but um, I guess the the fact that it's annotational science also makes it pretty hard to incorporate the senses with our new techniques and methods. Uh, and if it's hard at the level of architecture, it's also incredibly hard, hard at the level of urbanism. So all of this discussion, when when one is an architect and is sort of taking it in, you know, and is trying to do buildings that have to do with it, and as my fellow architect who had done the, the uh, building for the blind, uh, the discipline itself is not always equipped to answer a lot of this. Uh, issues of the sensorial practice. So it's not just notational aspects, there are methods, and there's a lot of aspects to the practice that uh, sometimes is very productive in fostering an engagement with the senses, as in when you're walking through the building and you see the light, you don't see the light. Architecture does that very well. How it deals with texture and how it deals with sound, how it deals with uh, smell, obviously, <laughs> It's a discipline that has to accommodate these things and is finding its ways to do so. So, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Further information about our programs and a complete archive of past Philip Tate's events is available at philiptates.org.